Hello. Um, my name is Alex, and uh, we're going to talk about Provide and Inject in View 3 today and why you might not need View X. Uh, I've already gone ahead and provided links to my slides and my demos, so if you want to grab that really fast, you can. I'm going to wait here just a couple of seconds, give you all time to kind of type that in, uh, and then we're going to move on. So first, we're going to talk about me a little bit. And Henry, I am so sorry, but I'm from Atlanta. We pronounce it Revere. So hi, I'm Alex Revere. I am a senior front-end developer at Trina. Uh, I'm a co-organizer of the Atlanta Vue.js meetup. I'm also co-host of the Enjoy the View podcast. So all that is to say, I like Vue a lot, and I kind of get into the weird uh, weeds of view sometimes. So this talk is going to be covering some advanced Vue.js concepts, right? This is not the stuff that we hand out to beginners. This is like, this is like needy, difficult stuff, right? So uh, the just as a warning, this may cause you some confusion, a sense of wonder, smug satisfaction that you know more than your friends and coworkers. Um, We'll start off by covering sort of the basic methods of passing state between components, right? We have props and emit, which Tessa very graciously gave us a wonderful chant about. Um, we have Vuex as an external store. We have dollar root and dollar parent, which I'm going to advise against you using. Don't use those. And then we have provide and inject. So let's dig into this a little bit. First, let's talk about props and emit. Now, with props, the way props work, we pass props from a parent component to a child component. And if we want to get data into the grandchild component, we'd go from the child component to the grandchild component, right? So it looks something like this. Um, and then similarly, if you want to get data out of the grandchild component to the parent component, we would emit events up to the parent component. And this is great. This is a great way of doing things. I think that people should be doing this all the time. This is a fantastic way of doing things. Uh, part of why is because it's explicitly defined what your props and events are. In uh, Vue 3, you can define your props as you could in Vue 2, but you can also define your events by using the emits property. You can say, hey, this is going to emit this type of event. So we can actually get very explicit about what we're wanting to, our component to be able to do. This also helps create reusable components. Everything that you need to make the component work is like right there. It's all the props and the events, and then it doesn't have to care about the outside world. It only cares about its little bubble that it lives in. Um, also, it doesn't rely on outside data structures, so we're not looking for a store to put things in. We're not looking for some outside module to give us information. It's just, it's all right there. And also it's easily testable because of all of this, right? You can just, you say, hey, give it this props, it should do this thing. If uh, if it click on this button, it should emit this event, right? Super easy to test that. Now, one of the problems with this method though, and I feel like eventually if you make a big enough thing, uh, you will hit this problem, is that, um, as your app gets larger, let's say that you have some data at a page level and you want to get it to something that's nested 15 components in, you suddenly have to pass a prop 15 components down to get to the thing that needs it, right? This is called prop drilling. And maybe it's good. Maybe you do actually need to do that. But maybe you don't, right? Maybe you really don't need to prop drill through 15 layers of components to get there. All right, so let's talk about global stores then, right? So we have this problem. We need to get data down into something that's really deep in there. Well, global store is the obvious solution, right? You you can access state from anywhere on your Vuex dollar store. Um, and similarly, you can update data from anywhere with your Vuex store, right? You can just committed mutation and there we go problem solved all right cool great yay we've solved this pinya does this even better right we've talked about pinya some today pinya does this even better because pinya is modularized right so you're only pulling in the bits that you need which is really great this is good um so let's talk about the pros and cons of this so the pros uh we have useful for large applications with shared state right you're gonna have state accessible everywhere and so like maybe that's a really good thing this is this is good for large applications. Um, so that's a fantastic thing. You can pair this with props and admit, 
as we've done before. You can have like your page bring in the uh, store information and then pass it as a prop to something else. So you still get those nice reusable testable components, but you are able to uh, couple it with a global data store. Um, now, a downside to this is that it implicitly uses store, right? It uses dollar store. Now, when I wrote this talk originally, it was Vue 2. I think the way that you use Vuex and the composition API is a little bit different. But ultimately, it's, it's saying, hey, dollar store is going to be there, right? So if you're building something where maybe you don't know what application you're going to be in, you're building a design library, you don't know that you'll have dollar store, or maybe you don't know if you have Pinya or Vuex, right? So the way that you interact with things may be different. So that's a downside of using Vuex. Uh, we also, it relies on an external dependency. You have to go get another library and bring it in, and that's another dependency, and that's more JavaScript and blah, 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 right? And it's not ideal for publishing modules, right? Once again, if you have a design system or you're wanting to make like a series of components that you want to uh, unleash on the world to make everything Comic Sans, then like relying on a, on a dollar store is not going to work for that because uh, it'll just break. So let's talk about dollar root. Now, dollar root is always available. If you are in a Vue application, dollar $root is always available. Uh, dollar $root is a way to refer to the base application, and you can store data on it. So in this case, we have a walking tree component, and it has a couple of children component inside of it, and both of them can just go dollar $root bit of data and get that data. This is great. If you're building prototypes and you need to do something really fast, this is a great way of being able to pass around data and have like globally accessible data. The problem with this is, if you take your little prototype that you've made and you move it into an application that's more complex and the structure changes, well, then the root changes too, and suddenly your bit of data isn't necessarily there. So we're so this is this is kind of fragile, right? Like this only works if you really know, like if you if you can really put your data in dollar root and it gets messy and yeah, it's not my favorite. This is not one that I recommend, right? So, so another option that is similar to this is dollar parent, right? Maybe, maybe we do need something that's more coupled to each other, right? So we have we have components that all rely on each other. So here we go. We can we can have three components: a parent component, child component, grandchild component, and uh, the child component can just go dollar parent knowledge and look at the parent component and get that information that it needs. And similarly with the grandchild component, it can get that same information by doing dollar parent, dollar parent knowledge, right? So this is great. This is fantastic. This gets a sort of more localized state that we can use that doesn't have to be accessible everywhere. It's not global state and we're able to sort of refer to it. We're not relying on an outside thing. This is good, right? Problem with this approach is it's brittle. So what I mean by brittle is, let's say somebody wants to do parent component and grandchild component, but no child component. It breaks because your grandchild component is now looking up two parents and the completely bypasses all of the knowledge, right? So this is this is also not ideal. Um, so we need something that is flexible, local, scopable, and available, right? Like implicitly available, but also not, but also kind of is. This is where provide and inject comes in, right? So we have provide and inject. So in this case, we have a series of components. And the way that provide and inject works is that the component that wants to provide will provide some data. And then the component that needs that data will inject that data. So it looks something like this. It sort of goes outside the normal flow. And this is flexible because it doesn't matter how many things you add in between, this will always work, right? This is always going to be as long as something is nested inside of the providing component, it will work. Now, I'm gonna go over really fast the actual technical implementation of how this magic works so that you're not wondering because I did for a while. So the way that this works is that we have a providing component. When it is created, a property on that component is created called provides, and it will provide whatever data you tell it to provide. When a child component is created, it then looks to its parent, copies everything from it and puts it on there too, right? So we're, we're reusing references. So we're referencing 
objects, this is how data can stay reactive. Similarly, next child does it. So when we get to the injecting component, it simply looks up one level to its parent, gets that data, and uses that reference. And there we go. We now have our data that is in sync with the data from our providing component. So that is the technical implementation of this. So provide and inject can be used to pass data between components um, and its descendants. It doesn't really rely on dollar root or parent or anything, and it doesn't re rely on like data structure or anything like that. It just, things need to be inside of the one that's providing data. So I'm sure that you want me to show you how this works already. So let's let's actually look at some code. So this is a reactive provider, right? And I've written it in two ways here. We have we have our view two and three version, which uses the options API. And so we have some data here. And for this to work, because it's a string, it's not an object, we need to pass the we need to provide a function to access the current value of text. Now, if this were a um, object in theory, you could pass the object, but that gets weird. Um, this is the cleanest way to really make sure that you're getting the fresh version of it. Similarly, with set text, it gives us a way to update our value. Um, now, with the view three composition API, we have it look a little different. We can just make a ref, which is a object that has a value, right? And then we can provide that ref with a name of text. And then we can return text and use it in our uh, template if we want to, right? So the composition API is a little bit more reduced. So let's look at what in inject looks like, right? So with inject, we're providing an array with names. Now inject works the same way that props does. So you could do an array with strings. You could do like an object with like get text and then curly bracket and then like uh, type equals function and like go all like fun stuff on it. We don't have to here. This is just an example. And in our in our options API version, I am making a complex computed value. We're defining a getter, which returns the current value of text. And I am making a setter, which returns the uh, which allows us to update it. And so now if we wanted to V model it on an input, we could, we just V model text and it would work. Composition API, once again, it's a lot easier. We just inject text, which is our value that we're looking for. And then we return that reactive ref object and we can apply it in a V model and it'll automatically update things in all over the place. Uh, so to show you this example, the code that you would write would be, you would have the re reactive provide, which I just showed you, and the reactive inject, which I also just showed you. So when we type something in here, it updates everything everywhere. And when we type something in here, it updates everywhere as well. So this is very handy, very useful. I like this quite a bit. Um, so where should I use this? You should use this when data is implicitly expected to be available. So what I mean by implicitly expected to be available is uh, when you have data that you know that you need, right? And you define a prop that is explicitly defining data. You're saying this component needs this data. When you have implicitly expected data, it is this component is going to work as long as it's inside of this thing and i'm not going to tell you why but it needs to be inside of that thing so a good example of this is compound components so a compound component is like two components that are expected to work together the best way to think of this is like a compound element in html right in html we have the select element which allows us to have a drop down and inside of that, you can't put anything except for options. Well, options and opt groups, but they just sort of stylistically change it. The options are the thing that actually do something, right? The options update the select and give it value. So those are that is a compound element. And so a compound component works the same way. You may have your custom select you could make a compound component there and have a cup custom option 
and it would be able to update that select in the background. Another place that you could use this is maybe you need like a global store, but locally, right? You don't need it everywhere. You just need it like there, right? You just need it in one spot and that'll be good enough. So that's another place that you could use this. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of this. So first we're gonna look at an example of an accordion and splitting it up into compound components. Now I'm going to be honest, I have stolen, I've blatantly stolen this example from Cassidy Williams React uh, workshop. She, uh, she and I talked about it. I said, hey, can I steal this? And she said, yes. So you should follow her if you aren't because She's great, but that is where this example comes from. I have just translated it into view. So look at our accordion. So this is a, an accordion. Uh, the way that accordions work, and I will show you how it actually works here, is uh, you would, uh, when you click on one of these titles, it sort of opens up a section and only one section can be open at a time, right? So we're tracking like what section is open and you need a way to be able to update that. So if we look at the code part here, you can see it's there's a wrapper and then we have like our section part for each section. Then we have like a title that's clickable because it's an A tag. And then we have like the content part, right? So this is sort of our setup template wise. And then we have an active index that we're tracking to make sure that if it's the current index, then we can say it's expanded. Um, and then we just have our sections data. Now, this is great. This is a great way to do this, but the problem with this is that it's not very flexible. So in theory, an accordion is just like a set of tabs, right? You, when you click on a tab, it opens up the, th the stuff that's in that tab. So it works the same way that an accordion does. So we could theoretically style this like, a set of tabs or we could um you know maybe the title shouldn't be at the top maybe it should be at the bottom maybe it should be on the side Ooh, getting fancy with it now so we'd have to make a new component every single time that we want to do this and that's just not that's not reasonable to have to make a new component every time that you want a slight variation on the same idea so let's break this up into four separate components that work together that are that make up a compound component. First the thing that we have is that we have the wrapper around the accordion itself. This is going to track our currently active section, right? Next we have the section, which is sort of like keeping track of all of the data about the section. And then we have a title and we have a panel, we have the content. So the title of it is going to be the thing that will activate it. And then the content is just gonna like display or not display, and that's it. So these are the four things that we need to make this happen. So let's see how to do that. So first we'll look at our accordion wrapper. Now with our accordion wrapper, I have a div over here um, with a slot in it, so we can put things inside of it. And we're going to import our ref and provide, and sorry, I did not give you a heads up about this. I'm writing everything in V3 and we're doing it with the composition API because it's, easier and more condensed for examples. So there you go. Uh, so we're gonna use ref and we're going to use provide and we're going to set up our active index. So this is the section that is currently open and we're gonna set it to zero. And then we're going to provide that reference. We're also gonna return it. So in case A, we'll be able to see it in dev tools and B, um, if we wanted to use it in the template or something, we could. Uh, so that's our wrapper. It's tracking one, one piece of information. It's not even using it, it's just tracking it, right? So it's sort of functioning kind of as a data layer. Then we have an accordion section. So this is the section that sort of wraps everything to say, this is a title, this is a content, and like, here's the section that we're in. And we're going to inject our active index. And I've set up a value here called section index. Now, this is a non-reactive value that will update um, every single time that we create a new section. So when the new section is created, uh, we will set a value to index. And index is also not reactive. The reason for that is, is that 
we don't need it to be. This is an identifier. We don't want it to change. So we don't want it to be reactive. So this is always going to be the same number. So we're going to set section index and make that equal or set that set index to section index, and then we're going to provide that index value. We're also going to increment section index. So the next one that gets created, the next section that gets created, it is a completely different number. You could do this with UUIDs if you wanted to. You could use like a random number generator, however you want to do this. I'm just doing an auto increment thing, right? Next, I'm going to provide two things. I'm going to provide activate, which is a uh, way to activate this index. So this section, we're going to activate this section. And then I'm going to provide a computed value called is active to check and see if the current section is active. Uh, and then I'm going to return the index. And that's it. Next up, we have two things. We have the title. So with the title, we're going to inject is active and activate. It is going to have um, some dynamic classes that are based on whether or not it is active. Uh, it'll have a different class. And then we're also going to have our activate function here. And when you click on our link, the section will activate. And there we go. That's our title. Last, we have our accordion. And all it does is that it checks to see whether or not it is active and change its class to be either open or closed based on that. Cool. So this is now what our our accordion looks like in with our new stuff. And I've actually added two accordions here, and you'll see why in a second. So with this first accordion, we have our accordion component, uh, which is our wrapper, tracks the active state or the active index. And then we have our accordion section, which we're just going to put a V4 and a key on because we're good people like that. Uh, we're going to have our accordion title and we're going to have our accordion content. But down here, I have the same accordion, but this time I have the accordion content above the accordion tile, title. So now when we actually look at the rendered results, up here we have our first set and we have the title above with the content below, but down here we mirror it. So it is actually reversed. So there we go. We are now using the same set of components. They are providing data back and forth. We're not trying to do some weird thing with scope slots and like passing things around. We just say these all work together. Use them. Great. So what else? Now, I made this talk a few years ago and I kind of made a clickbaity title for this one. And so you may not need Vuex. I'll be honest, I didn't think that this would get chosen. So I've had to dig a bit to make a really good example here. Um, now, you may not need Vuex because you can use provide as sort of a data layer. And what I mean by data layer is a lot of times when I'm using a global store, what I find myself using it for is just, it's a place to go fetch data. That's it, that's all that I use it for. It's talking to an API. But it's talking to an API for every page of my application and all of the information about how to talk to the API for every page of my application is there regardless of whether or not I'm on that page. So it's not a great system, right? So maybe what we really just need is a data layer. So rather than putting all of your logic about how to go fetch data into a component, or into a, a module and into a Vuex store that's globally available, maybe you only need to put it on the page that you're on. Maybe you just need a provider that wraps the page that you're on. That's a possibility. Um, you could also, you know, as we've seen, we sort of, we can make it really local too, right? You will only load the data when you need it to. So you could have it not trigger the load on page load, you could actually be like, don't load this data until you hover over the thing, right? Like that's a possibility. Um, and it might solve the problem of having a giant Vuex store that loads every page that has more stuff than the page that you're on. With that, I'm going to introduce the mildly over-engineered counter component. Uh, so we'll take a look at it first so that I can explain to you what's going on. We This is our counter component. We can click plus one. 
we can click minus one. When we click plus one, it updates. Maybe it calls an API. Maybe it does something with um, uh, like a stream or something. I don't know. It does something, right? So this is our this is our overly complicated counter component. So let's look at how we actually implemented this. First, what we're going to do is that we're going to make a data layer component. Now, this data layer component is going to have a reactive a reactive object. And on that object, I'm going to have two things. I'm going to have state and I'm going to have response. So this is mimicking a fetch call. This is how I like to track fetch calls. Typically, I will have a state to say one of four states, ready, pending, resolved, or rejected. And then I will have the response, which is the response assuming that it's resolved. Typically, I will also have an error state. This is a simple demonstration. I'm not tracking error state in this because I'm just not. So we now have our counter, which is our reactive data. I'm going to make a read only version of our counter. This gives us something that we can pass as state via provide and other things can use it, but they can't update it. So this makes it sort of the like single source of truth. You're not going to be able to update this from somewhere else. You're only going to be able to update it here. Next, I'm going to make a function called update count. And to update count, you give it a new value. So when we update count, we're going to go into a pending state because we're going to make a fetch call. We make our fetch call, which is a sleep function. We're then going to set the new value to our response because that is the response that we got from our fetch call. And then we are going to set our state to resolved because the fetch resolved. Now then, I'm going to go ahead and initialize our count here because you'll notice up here, our response is set to null because we have no information. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to initialize it up here. So we're actually, we do start off with an unknown state where we don't have a value for response. And then I'm going to provide two functions. We have a uh, counter slash read, and that's going to be our state, and then counter slash write, which is a place to actually go write things to. So that is our data layer. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't display anything. Actually, if we go look at the template, you can see it's literally a slot. It's just a slot. Anything that you put inside of there will render. This renders as a document fragment. So it doesn't even have an element to associate with it. Next, we have our counter display component. This displays the counter. That's it. Uh, we check to see if it's null using the nullish coalescer, which is a great, I love that one. And if it is null, we put a question mark. And then we have our buttons. And our buttons, all that they do is they increment by using the update counter call. And they check to see if the state is in a resolved state. And if it is not in a resolved state, then the buttons will be disabled. So our click buttons will be disabled. You won't be able to click on them. And then you can either increment by one or increment by negative one. That's it. So let's look at that counter again. So here I'm importing my provider, my buttons, and my display. In our template, we just have a provider wrapping our buttons, and then our display is inside of the buttons. And so when we look at the result, you'll see it starts off with a question mark and the buttons disable every single time that you increment like it's doing a fetch call. So this is an overly engineered example, but it demonstrates that you could make something. If you if you are making a, an application that has a lot of edit pages, right? And you need to get a single object on that page. You don't need to use a store mechanism that you can access anywhere on the page. You just you need it inside of that. You need it for that form. You need the data for that form and you need a way to update the data for that form and that's it. You don't need it for the entire page. Also, you can, you know, maybe wrap your entire application in if you wanted to. You could, in theory, just say, hey, cool, I'm just going to provide the entire store from this data layer that wraps my entire application. 
So there you go. You have options. This is this is not a tool I'm saying that you need to use. This is a tool I am saying you can use. You should have this in your back pocket as an option to use when you need it. So what have we learned? There are many ways of passing data between components. We have props and emit, Vuex, brute and parent, provide and inject. We've also learned that provide and inject can be used to implicitly pass data. So it gives you a way to sort of behind the scenes pass data between components and they look magical. Uh, provide and inject is great for compound components where you're really needing to just do something repeatedly and maybe have a very flexible way of doing it. And we can also make our own data layers that uh, provide data to an app or to a route or to just a local component. That is my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be available after this. And yeah, and uh, that is um, that is my talk. So thank you so much. Do you really have an Alex dot party? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I love it. That's my I mean, blog. I mean, I got, I, yeah. I I was typing. I go domain hunting every once in a while, and every once in a while, you just you know type your name in, and it suggests things. And it was like Alex dot party. <laughs> Four dollars, and I was like, "Well, best four dollars <laughs> ever I own spent." That to me now. <laughs> Amazing! I like that, Alex Party. Wow! You know that is cool. Um, you know, uh, great. Uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> you vanished. You came back. You know, so Crazy was partying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm like, yo, don't end the party now. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, deeply, uh, very, very thorough. And uh, you had a lot of things uh, you mentioned that we were just kind of discussing. Yeah, like and also I want to just point out before we discuss this. Okay. Tessa said you have like loads of unicorns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, what's um, the obsession? Show us a few. Come on, show me. I got, Look I got at it. Oh, this my one. God. I got this one. I got, uh, got this one. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Ben actually, Ben sent me this one. This is oh, a this cool. is a great yeah, one. I love one. this one's a cloudinary one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I got I got I got a bunch of unicorns. Nice. All right. So we could have we could have Alex .unicorn. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, is there like a, a is there like a dot uni or something like that or? It's not as fun like, though, is it? No, I, I like Alex .party. That one wins. Yeah, that one wins. Alex yeah. .party definitely. Uh, rocks yeah um one thing actually uh i wanted to talk to you about real quick before we get into <laughs> the next talk uh we're already late but um i'm a big supporter of meetups and you run one yeah and uh you know i often say that people uh unfortunately have sort of like you know sometimes disregard meetups and you know um especially in this current time uh, what has it been like for you? Are you still running the meetup or are you, you maintaining? So it's it's definitely uh, the Atlanta Vue.js meetup has definitely died down a bit. And PyATL was, I, I also co-run, co-organized the uh, Atlanta PyATL meetup for Python. Mm -hmm. So I have like two of them that I'm navigating. Um, the Python one, we had started transitioning to digital stuff like a few months before everything shut down. Wow. wow. And so it, we already had like a defined space where it was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, we're already doing stuff in here, so we'll just start moving stuff in here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with Atlanta Vue.js, it was a lot harder because I was suddenly like, okay, cool. Now I have to uh, run Zoom meetings now. Uh, and um, it became a bit more complex. Uh, it, it has been a boon and a bad thing to go virtual with all the meetups. Yeah. Um, it has definitely made it easier to find speakers because I can just go like, oh, you're in Oregon? That's great, would you wanna talk on the East Coast? And they're like, oh yes, I would. Yeah. Um, so it makes it, 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 has, it has definitely widened the pool of people that I can get to speak, but it is, it is challenging and difficult. Yes, um, it is challenging. To get sure. speakers. You know, yeah. so. It, it can be tough, but you know, um, good on you for for keeping that going because I think uh, meetups are super duper important. And uh, we were just talking about uh, the They're fact that a great place to get a job, right? Yeah, You're networking yes. people. Networking is great. A lot of times, as a meetup organizer, we will have for PyATL, we always had a, a 
a point we were at about 50 people showing up and every time we would have a place we'd be like, okay, cool. Who needs a job and who is looking for people who need jobs? And you'd get a bunch of people being like, I like raising hands and like, and so you'd get a lot of job people looking for stuff and uh, hiring and whatnot. So yeah, it's always good to go to networking events like meetups and Sometimes, a lot of times, if there's a big conference in town, if there's a big conference in town, your meetup organizer probably knows about it and uh, will probably be trying to snipe one of the speakers from the big conference in town to come speak up at the meetup as long as they're in town. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. So, but that's cool. awesome. Now, we just want to big up, big up uh, meetups. Yes, speaking of jobs, View Jobs. Yes, this, uh, this was sponsored by View Jobs. View Jobs, thank you very much for being so kind <laughs> as to uh, sponsor uh, ViewConf Toronto. So we appreciate the love. Um, Alex, dot yeah. party, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, we're going to <laughs> we're proceed gonna, and, we would, and have yeah, you. We're uh, going to send you off to party in the session. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so now you're yeah. off to the pa- session. Par- so. Party over my session. Let's yeah. go, people. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's thank go. You, Alex. All right. If you want to party with Alex, you know what to do. Head off to the session. <laughs> thank you very much, Alex. Alex. Uh,